Micronesians. Who are they? Where did they come from? Long, long ago, there was a man living in Katao, off to the east. This man, Sapkini, built a large canoe that could carry many people. His people believed that the sky was a rope that touched the sea far away. And if you went to the place where the sky meets the sea, you would find land. Sapkini asked the other men and women to go with him in his sailing canoe. On their voyage, they saw an octopus and asked him who he was and where land could be found. The octopus told them his name and said that he lived on a shore that runs north-south. The canoe went on and found the home of the octopus, a reef with a small bit of coral jutting out of the water. On this tiny outcropping, they began building their island from stones and rocks brought from faraway lands. Sea people, these outer islanders are sometimes called. The name is fitting for their ancestors made their way here over hundreds, thousands of miles of open sea. Their early history is shrouded in the mists of the past, but the languages they speak and the tools they use offer clues to this past. These people speak languages that seem to have sprung from a common ancestral language, perhaps a few hundred years before Christ. The group that we call Nuclear Micronesia consists of uh, Kitabas, or the Gilberts, uh, the Marshalls, Korshai, the Pohnpeic languages, Pohnpean, Mokalese, Pingalapis, and then the whole Chukit continuum uh, from Mortlockese to the outer islands of Yap. The assumption is that uh, all of these people uh, came from uh, a, a, an ancest a single ancestral uh, linguistic group. This common language group in turn has its roots in a much larger language family that began in Taiwan perhaps 6,000 or 7,000 years ago. All, all the languages in Micronesia uh, and geographic Micronesia are belong to this huge language family called Austronesian, which is actually the second largest language family in the world. This ancestral group 
made their way down the Philippines into what is now Indonesia, and from there moved into the Pacific in their ocean-going sailing canoes. There had to be a first voyage to the western edge of Micronesia, the Marianas, and then later to Palau and Huap. So that's 1,400 plus nautical miles. That's a long ways. And that's, that's really something to have done that thousands and thousands of years ago. But they did it. The celestial and other forms of navigation that the Micronesians employed and their wonderful double-ended, latine-rigged, hot rod canoes are marvels of the ancient world. Uh, let's take the latine sail itself. It turns out to be it's probably the most efficient sail shape ever invented. So it gets the most speed out of the wind. I like the old European word for them, the flying proas. Even though linguistically it has nothing to do with Micronesia, the proa is up from Prahu, from Indonesia. But the flying proa gives you the idea these things fly. They don't just trudge through the ocean. We often talk about Micronesians and Polynesians and some Melanesians as great seafarers. They're also good farmers. It's, it's sort of tough to live on fish alone. You know, you've got to have some vegetable foods. You don't just get in your canoe and go and then eat all the fruits off the, come to an island and eat all the fruits and dig up all, all the yams and all the taro because they're not there. You have to bring your own foods with you not just to eat on the way, but planting materials so that you can recreate your agricultural base to combine with your fishing and so forth to develop a life. Sailing across thousands of miles of water these early voyagers settled all of what is now called Micronesia, a Greek word meaning tiny islands. But in the west of this area lie Palau, Yap, and the Marianas, islands whose people speak languages much less closely related than the Micronesians to the east. It's quite clear that the languages in the West have a different origin than the nuclear Micronesian group. It could well be that Micronesia is actually a much more recent uh, uh, construction or invention that we realize and that was born of the association that was promoted by the Trust Territory government. Whatever their origin, these early voyagers settled the islands and made a new life for themselves. They built a culture based on fishing and farming. They traveled from island to island on their flying proas, making new connections and trading goods with one another. They lived in relative isolation for thousands of years. Until one day, One day, we saw an unusual ship in the distance. It sailed in the entrance of the harbor, and strange-looking creatures began to get off. We thought they were gods, so we brought food and drinks as a welcome. The men were clad in iron, and a man in black with a crucifix was with them. There was some kind of misunderstanding, and our friendly greeting was soon followed by fighting. We had strong words, and a battle followed with many of our people killed. 
the strangers could not be hurt because of their strong skin. Our knives and spears could do nothing. They were finally overpowered and one was peered in the eyes through the Pfizer opening. Who are these men and what do they come for? People from across the sea, Europeans and later Americans, Japanese and Chinese too, along with Filipinos and many others. Magellan was the first in 1521, sailing under the Spanish flag to find a route to the Indies. He and his exhausted and famished crew put in at Umatic Bay for a few days before sailing off to the west. Ferdinand Magellan, he's the first white man to ever set foot on a Pacific island, uh, Guam being the first place. And he's also the first white man to order the killing of native peoples. He's the first person of record to have been here stayed only for three days and then sailed off to the Philippines where he was later killed by the, uh, the natives there. More ships followed, some stopping to trade while others merely caught a fleeting glimpse of an island from shipboard. Names of islands began appearing on western maps. Islas de los Reyes, the island of the three kings, near Yap, sighted on that feast day. Isla de los Martires, an atoll west of Chuk where two sailors were slain. And San Bartolome, somewhere in the Northern Marshals. The West had discovered these distant islands, and the islanders had now discovered the West. A few brief encounters had taken place, but they were the start of a process that would change island life forever. Whatever the relation between these sea peoples in the deep recesses of their past, the coming of the European signaled a new age and the beginning of an adventure that people from every part of the region shared. It was the start of the age when they would all be known as Micronesians. This is a church of Blessed Diego Luis de San Vitores, named for the Jesuit priest who headed the first mission to the Marianas, in fact, the first mission to any of the islands in the Pacific. Father San Vitores was bound for an assignment in the Philippines when his ship made a reprovisioning stop at Guam in 1662. Shortly after this, he wrote to his family in Spain. My desire is for the mission of the island of the Ladrones. They were the first pagans I saw, and it touched my heart to see their unfortunate fate, since they were so neglected and there was no one to preach to them the gospel. 
I now understand the meaning of the words in scripture. I have sent you to preach the gospel to the poor. For the next few years, San Vitores barraged the Spanish court with letters requesting permission to found the mission in those islands. The Jesuit won the support of the Queen Mother, Maria Anna of Austria, the woman who lent her name to the Mariana Islands. But Spanish claims to the Marianas date back to a century earlier. Actually, Miguel de la Gaspi, uh, on his expedition of 1565, he took possession of Guam and the Marianas uh, for the King of Spain. For about 100 years, uh, the Spanish didn't do anything in Guam other than using Guam to reprovision their early galleon. Uh, they pick up water and fresh food in Guam and proceeded on to the Philippines or to Mexico. On June 14, 1668, San Vitores and five other Jesuits, together with several Filipino and Mexican catechists and an escort of some 30 Spanish troops, arrived on Guam to plant the cross on the island. With it, they also planted the flag of Spain, the nation that sponsored their endeavor. A local chief, Kipua, welcomed them. Immediately they set out to work, baptizing hundreds in Kipua's village in the surrounding area, and soon setting up the first school in the Pacific, San Juan de Letran. But within a short time, as a priest spread out to other parts of Guam and the Northern Islands, violence broke out. A couple of the catechists were killed, then a few of the soldiers. Then, in 1670, less than two years after their arrival, one of the priests was slain. The attacks were blamed at first on a Chinese castaway named Choco, who was telling the islanders that the priests were poisoning people with the water they poured on their heads during baptism. But there were other explanations for the hostility. The intense rivalry between villages in an island group that was split into many local factions the way in which the missionaries offended people as they lashed out at island customs, the indiscretions of the soldiers, perhaps, in seizing property and pursuing local women. In April 1672, as they were returning from the northern part of Guam, San Vitores and his catechists stopped at Tumon to see a family that had become Christian. San Vitores intended to baptize an infant, but was warned by Matapang, the father of the child, and now a renegade Christian, not to do so. He baptized the child anyway. When Matapang returned with another man, both of them set upon the priest. While one stabbed him, the other slashed with a sword. San Vitores's body was dumped into the nearby ocean. So every year in his anniversary, the uh, two moon water there turns red. That it happened every year in his anniversary. And they call the red tide.
For the next 12 years, there was intermittent violence in the archipelago. Other priests and mission helpers and soldiers were killed. Each new attack was answered by a military expedition that resulted in houses burned, canoes destroyed, and a few Chamorros left dead. There was one man, Jose Quiroga, who was three times the governor of Guam, and he was the general patent of Guam. He, with a vengeance, went after the Chamorros and killed them. The resistance was broken in time. People on Guam were resettled in a half dozen pueblos or villages. Gradually, the people from the Northern Islands were brought down to Guam and Rota, where they too were resettled. But the Chamorros were far fewer by then. Disease and dislocation along with the other hardships of guerrilla warfare, soon reduced their numbers to a fraction of the population 30 years earlier. By 1700, the entire population of the Marianas was living in the new towns within earshot of the church bells, which marked the parts of the day just as they did the seasons of the year. Angelus bells three times a day, the bells to signal the beginning of daily mass, the slow tolling of the nine bells for the De Profundis at the death of a villager. Then there were the religious processions and fiestas, which remain an important part of life even today. And this was the culture that we had here, dominated by the church and the calendar of the church. And the people were dedicated to that. Uh, the people embraced Catholicism. The island had not changed much when the French naval captain, de Montorville, stopped there in 1828. Guam was a real contrast with other islands in the Pacific. Church steeples, crosses planted on cliffs, houses that resembled the poorer quarters of Manila, and the old Catholic atmosphere recalled old familiar memories. Dumont de Ville goes on to describe the people he saw. The women wore nothing on their heads or on their feet, but they were decently clothed in a skirt or jacket, with cigars in their mouths, crosses hanging from their necks, their hairstyles partly Spanish and partly Italian. The types of people were interesting to observe. Here, a teacher with balding head and glossy side locks carrying under his arm a book that summarizes all scientific learning. There, an islander caressing his favorite fighting cock, his fortune and his joy. Again, the master of the house, the brave hunter of deer with his bare chest, his white blue pants and his knife at his side. Such were the scenes I saw as I came upon the village. Guam 
which was at the periphery of the Spanish overseas empire, would lapse into semi-isolation. The tedium of life was broken by the arrival of the galleon that brought the government subsidy and supplies each year. A few days of partying and then life returned to normal. Now and then, a canoe load or two of Carolinians put into Guam to trade for iron, that wondrous material that could be used for fashioning fish hooks, adzes, and other tools. Then they too would depart for their home islands to the south. China, Cathay as it was once called, the fabled source of exotic and valuable products. Silk, fine porcelain ware, tea, medicines of many kinds, all coveted by European traders. The Silk Road, winding for thousands of miles overland through places infested with brigands, once brought these goods to European markets. But by the 18th century, Europe had made sea lanes its new highways. England, on its way to becoming the mistress of the seas, established a giant mercantile corporation the East India Trading Company, and a never-ending flotilla of ships sailed from England around the southern tip of Africa to China to carry back to European markets the riches of the Orient. Often enough, these ships would make for Australia to drop off a load of prisoners at the new penal colony before making their way to the China coast. Two of the ships from the first fleet in 1788, the Scarborough and the Charlotte, were looping around to the northeast when they happened on a number of small coral atolls around the equator and to the north. The islands were named for the ship captains, William Marshall and Thomas Gilbert. A few years earlier, in 1783, an East India merchantman, the Antelope, was returning from China when it was caught in a storm near Palau. The Antelope sank, but the crew made it to Oolong Island. It was there that the ship's captain, Henry Wilson, set up camp. In time, he befriended the chief of Karor, known as Ibadul. Wilson was carried out to meet the chief in his canoe, and before long, Palauans and Englishmen were sharing tea and biscuits for breakfast. But this was not all Wilson shared with Ibadul. To demonstrate the power of a musket, he brought down a fowl with a single shot, while the people watched in astonishment. Wilson's lesson was not lost on the chief and his men from Karor. The British were invited to fight alongside the forces of Karor as they raided their old rival Malekiok and later made an attack on the nearby island of Peleliu. Wilson was in Palau for only three months 
while he fitted out a small boat that he and his crew could sail to Asia. With the consent of Ibadul, the British took the chief's son, Li Bu, back to England aboard their new ship. There, he became the darling of high society before dying of smallpox, just six months after his arrival. Wilson and his crew had introduced Palauans to firearms and gunpowder. Even after he and the rest of the crew set sail, he left behind one of his men, Madden Blanchard, to teach the islanders how to use guns and cannons. For the next hundred years, these weapons would be the most coveted trade good. Guns would play a key role in the contest for political ascendancy among the highly competitive villages in Palau, and so altered the alignment of villages in the local political system over the next century. The British East India Company was not the only player in the China trade. Ships from other nations, from Europe, from North America, and from the Philippines claimed their own share of the lucrative commerce. They gathered beche de mer, turtle shell, sandalwood, whatever they could find that might be used as barter with the Chinese merchants. Beginning in the late 1700s, and through the early years of the 1800s, they came. Vessels bound for China, crisscrossing the Pacific. Some of them stopped to barter for shell and beche de mer. Some of them merely sighted islands on which they bestowed names. A few of the names survive even to the present. South of Palau is Helen's Reef, named after an East India Company ship. The captain of a Bechdemer trader out of Manila gave his name to Dublon Island in Chuk Lagoon. James Mortlock, the captain of an India man, left his mark on the island group just south of Chuk Lagoon that even today we know as the Mortlock Islands. Then, as quickly as the China trade appeared, it was gone. It was one of those passing commercial phases in the story of the Pacific, a comet that blazed a trail across the sky before it was extinguished. But another comet was just beginning to appear, another major commercial venture one that was destined to have an even larger impact on the islands. Oh, the captain gives the order to sail the ocean wide where the sun it never sets me lads nor darkness dims the sky and it's cheer up me lads let your hearts never fail for the bonnie ship the diamond goes a fishing far away our captain stood upon the deck a spyglass in his hand a viewing of those gallant whales that blew at him A U.S. naval officer wrote in 1840 that the American whaling fleet was whitening the Pacific with its sail. Ships set out from New Bedford, Nantucket, New London, Sag Harbor, Salem, and a dozen other ports 
in search of the mighty whale. Whale ships cruise the Pacific for weeks and months at a time. Once a whale was spotted, the crew rowed out to it in longboats, harpooned it, and drew it alongside the ship. On board, they stripped off the blubber and boiled it down to produce the oil that was used to light the lamps of a thousand U.S. towns. The crews were made up of young, uneducated farm boys and city dwellers, off to see the world and pick up a little money. Their life aboard ship during the two or three years the voyage lasted was long monotony interrupted by brief periods of exhausting and dangerous work while they were chasing and cutting up a whale. Discipline was harsh, even brutal at times, while the rewards were very poor. As I was a walking down Paradise Street, away, way, hey, blow the man down, a pretty young damsel, a chance for to me. Islands like Ponape and Koshrai, with their rich foliage and creviced waterfalls, would have looked like Eden to the crew of a whale ship at anchor for a couple of weeks. But the whale ship must have appeared just as inviting to islanders who greeted the crew from the shore. Boat crews went ashore to fill their casks with fresh water from the streams and cut a supply of firewood. They also purchased fresh island produce as a change from the monotonous shipboard fare of hardtack and salt meat. Yams could be bought for seven pounds of tobacco or a dollar eighty a barrel. Taro, bananas, and other fresh foods could be had for comparable prices. Chickens and pigs were sometimes furnished as well. The whale ship Elizabeth at anchor off Ponape in 1850 reported, Purchased 21 turtles, 400 heads of taro, 30 bunches of bananas and 2,000 coconuts, all for trade to the value of $40. The attractions of the trade for island people were great. The men prized metal tools and muskets, not to mention the red calico shirts that were so popular everywhere. Kashrayan women could proudly display their gingham blouses while Panopean women favored tight-waisted dresses and printed kerchiefs which they wore around their necks. For everyone there was the allure of tobacco and the clay pipes in which it was smoked. Sally Brown, she's a bright new ladder. Hey, hey, roll and go. She drinks rum and chews her backer. Spend my money on Sally Brown. There's an old saying that the whalers wanted three things from the islands at which they called. Wood, water, and women. There was a good supply of all three at Ponape and Koshrai. But she would always dilly-dally Spend my money on Sally Brown The British whale ship Gypsy stood off Ponape in March 1841 with four other ships lying at anchor. The author of the journal, a surgeon, wrote, All the ships had been lying here two or three weeks, wooding and watering and giving liberty to their crews on shore. Pigs are scarce and dear. Breadfruit is plentiful but the most cheap and procurable article is a girl, as many as would stock a three-tailed Borshaw's harem for a few heads of tobacco. Two
Children, young girls and women crowd aboard the ships. Their ages from 9 to 14 or 16 years of age. There are but few with the fully developed signs of womanhood. The whale ship Gypsy, Pompeii, March 1841. Venereal disease, or the pox as it was then called, took its toll on Koshrai as well as Pompeii, disfiguring many of its victims. An officer on a whale ship at Koshrai wrote, One day when out cutting ironwood poles we came to a small village, and the sight of the people in it was perfectly terrible. They were simply eaten up alive with the most loathsome of diseases. The state some of them were in was so sickening that I hurried away into the woods and cursed the white man who had turned loose this horrible thing among these poor helpless people. The sight of those in that village where they had been put out by themselves to be slowly eaten up by the disease haunted me for years. Charles W. Morgan, Kosrai, October 1852. But there was even worse. The ship Inez of New Bedford, in port at Koshrai in January 1848 with four other ships, estimated Koshrai's population at 1,500, but reported that people were dying daily of an epidemic. Two years later, another whaling captain at Koshrai noted in his log the population is decreasing through prevalence of colds, consumption, and other diseases. Then, on February 28, 1854, the whale ship Delta put in at Ron Kitchi, Ponape, after suffering an outbreak of smallpox. One seaman who had died of the disease was buried ashore. Two other men, sick with the disease, were left on the beach. Both men died soon afterwards. When Ponopeans took the clothes from the infected men, the disease spread throughout the island. Smallpox has broken out on the island. The panic-stricken natives fly to the mountains and to uninhabited islands. Then they come back again, seize some victim of the disease to carry to their homes, thus spreading the contagion to all parts, so that a spot cannot be found where it is not doing fearful execution. Letter of Albert Sturges, July 12, 1854. For five months, an epidemic raged in Panape, claiming the lives of 4,000 people nearly half the island's population. The whalers had brought more than metal tools, calico, and tobacco. They brought diseases from across the sea and death. Desertions by whale ship crew members were a frequent occurrence. Wilson, on the Gypsy in 1841 at Ponape, notes in his journal, I understand there are upwards of 80 white men on the island, English, Portuguese, American, etc. The advice of those in the harbour was that we had better keep out, as little or nothing was to be had, excepting wood, and water and plenty of bad yams, and sailors were too apt to desert their ships influenced by the temporary fascinations of the women. The Whale Ship Gypsy, Pompeii, 1841.
One of the ships in harbor at that time did not even have enough hands left to get underway. So many of the crew had left the ship. In 1843, seven men deserted from the whale ship Fortune, leaving only four men before the mast. In 1851, another whale ship, the William and Mary, left seven men ashore, four of them Portuguese. As whaling traffic peaked in the early 1850s, the size of the foreign community on Ponape grew to about 150. The same might have happened in Koshrai if the paramount chief had not been so assiduous in ridding the island of deserters periodically. Hard pressed to replace the deserters, many whaling captains would offer berths to islanders signing them on under names like John Bull, Joe Kanaka, and Jim Crow. In 1865, one ship alone, the Charles W. Morgan, carried off a total of four Ponopeans, two as crew members and two as stowaways. There were many island men who welcomed the adventure of a tour of duty on a whale ship, if only to see more of the world that was being introduced to them. Even for those who never signed on as a hand, the world had grown so much larger. Kanka, the son of the paramount chief on Koshrai, impressed one seaman greatly for his sophistication. He was the most remarkable native I have ever met. He could repeat from the life of Washington, Bonaparte, Wellington, passage after passage, and about the battles they fought he could tell in detail. He shamed me one day by asking how many presidents and what were their names the United States has had since it became free from England, and then repeating the number of names. Charles W. Morgan, Cushai, October 1852. The impact of whaling touched even some of the nearby coral atolls like Mokil. It had become a tidy little community, impressive for its cleanliness and order. At one end of the island was a flagstaff on which a white ensign was hoisted whenever a ship was sighted. There was a chapel and a bowling alley used by both Mokalese and seamen. All the men wore trousers. A Swedish naval vessel that visited the island in 1852 reports. The two Americans had arrived on a vessel a half year before and sold their belongings, pigs, chickens, and fruit to passing ships. They often made $40 a month in this trade. The wives of the two Americans, one had five and the other only four, were extremely friendly creatures, dressed in cotton blouses, smoking their small clay pipes. Swedish naval frigate Eugenia at Mokil, 1852. If whaling never had the same impact on the Marshalls or in Western Micronesia, this was because these islands did not offer the supply of water needed. Yap and Palau were too far off the main whaling grounds to be convenient stopovers. industry was all but dead by the mid-1860s, but its effect on the islands it touched was enormous. There was a disease and depopulation, especially on Koshrai, where the numbers continued to fall until the 1880s. But there was also the trade with ships, 
which brought Ponape an estimated $8,000 a year and Kashraya perhaps $5,000 by the height of whaling traffic. As one measure of that trade, Ponapeans owned 1,500 muskets by 1850. Among the many whalers who remained in Ponape are James Hadley, John Eldridge, and Joseph Keogh, all of whom founded large, influential families. But there was something else islanders had acquired during those years. A growing sophistication and an expanded understanding of the great world that lay beyond their reef. In 1952, three American couples, Albert Sturgis and his wife Susan, Luther and Louisa Gulick, and Benjamin Snow and his wife Lydia, left Boston for the islands. Two Hawaiian couples joined them in Honolulu. They were being sent to bring the gospel to Micronesia. The American board churchmen had founded a successful mission in Hawaii 30 years before, and now they were seeking new fields for their labors. What better field than Eastern Micronesia, where they might repair the damages done by their fellow countrymen? One of the mission society leaders put it this way. The shadows of heathenism had been deepened by the presence of men from lands of light, whose lives cast only shadows. In August 1852, the Sturgises and Guliks were landed on Ponape with one of the Hawaiian helpers, while the Snows and the other Hawaiian family were left at Koshrai. The paramount chief of Koshrai whom foreigners referred to as Good King George, promised that he would be a father to Mr. and Mrs. Snow. He made good on this promise, providing them a home and watching over them during the missionaries' 10 years on the island. On Plenipe, the Guliks set up a mission station in Medellinim. Meanwhile, Reverend Sturgis and his wife found a strong protector in the Nankin of Kitchi, one of the most influential men on the island. The Nankin's wife was the daughter of James Hadley, a whaler who had lived ashore for years, and their adopted son was Henry Nanpe. The Nanakin soon clamped down on traffic in women with the ships. The Nanakin issued his order that no more women were to visit the ships. For a while there was some complaining, but matters soon quieted as several houses of ill fame were opened on shore by foreigners. There were five houses run by foreigners in this part of the island. After years of anxious efforts, the Nanakin personally wrote and posted upon the doorposts of all five houses taboos to all females. Letter of Albert Sturges, July 12, 1854. On Kushrai, it was six years before the first members were received into the church, but progress was swift after that. 
Ministers were ordained soon afterwards, and church membership grew, even as the population dropped, until it included everyone on the island. In 1857, just five years after the arrival of the first missionaries in the Carolines, preparations were being made to expand the mission to the east. Reverend Pearson and his wife, along with Reverend and Mrs. Dong, were on their way to the Marshalls to begin work there. The Marshalls were virgin territory as far as the missionaries were concerned. They were still free from the influence of foreign ship crews and beachcombers that was to be found on other islands. But that was because of the notorious reputation for inhospitality that the islands had acquired, thanks to repeated attacks on ships there. Reverend Edward Doan reported, In 1834, Captain Dowsett mysteriously disappeared at Rongelap. In 1845, Captain Cheney of the Nyad had trouble with the dwellers upon Ebon, and one man was killed on the spot. In October 1852, the schooner Glencoe of San Francisco was burnt and the crew murdered by the inhabitants of Ebon. The reason for this conduct is that when the king was a young man, a ship visited Ebon and an islander stole something which gave occasion for a disturbance. A general attack was made on the islanders, and many were killed, among them the chief Kaibuki's oldest brother. Kaibuki received a wound in the arm from a spade. His father declared he would have revenge and that he would kill all the whites he could and cut off ships when possible. When the missionaries were landed on Ebon, they found themselves under the protection of none other than Kaibuki, the same chief who had waged a vendetta against Westerners for years. Kaibuki, once the formidable foe of Westerners, exchanged names with Reverend Pearson and told him that henceforth he would consider the missionary his son. The chief scrupulously kept his word protecting the missionaries from harm and safeguarding their property. The growth of the church in the Marshalls was rapid Hawaiian missionaries replaced the American pastors within a short time, and they soon carried the gospel to the other islands in the archipelago, first Namarik and Jaluit, and then to Majro and Mili. Mission progress in the Marshalls was linked to the success of its schools. To meet the growing demand for education, the mission school on Ebon doubled in enrollment within three months, and two new schools soon had to be opened in the atoll. Reverend Edward Doan reported, At all hours, through the day and into the evening, our house is thronged with scholars writing on their slates or reading. Many youth drop by in the evening and stay as long as we allow, reading and writing. Our little printing office, too, is the scene of similar interest. There are many faithful typesetters there, and the sheets printed are read over before the ink is fully dry upon them. Thanks to the missionaries, the school had now become part of Micronesian life.
With the opening of the first training school on Ebon in 1869, a steady stream of Marshallese pastors and teachers were produced. By 1872, the last of the Hawaiian missionaries had left the islands and Marshallese staffed their own churches. Within 15 years of its founding, the church in the Marshalls was fully under the control of local people. Training schools, the rough equivalent of today's high schools, were producing a crop of local church leaders. Three Panapeans and their wives, all products of the training school, set out for the Mortlocks in 1873 to carry the gospel to the Chuk area for the first time. Chuk, like the Marshalls, had a reputation for unfriendliness and was shunned by Western seamen. Yet the Panapean teachers were well cared for and they were soon working their way up the Mortlocks to the very threshold of the Chuk Lagoon. But here, progress stalled. It wasn't until several years later, in 1879, that the Panapean pastor Moses was finally invited to begin preaching on the island of Uman. The mission in Chuk was founded at last. When Robert Logan arrived a few years later to begin work on Wena Chuk, there were already 15 churches established in Chuk and the Mortlocks. Chiefs on other islands were clamoring for a mission teacher of their own, now a mark of prestige. Chuk, which never had the paramount chiefs of its neighbors to the east, was rent with sporadic inter-island warfare it was such wars that posed the biggest problem for the people, Christians or not. Reverend Logan became legendary for walking into the thick of battle with his trademark black umbrella held high over his head. Within minutes, the fighting would subside with hostile parties returning to their own villages. Island warfare may not have entirely ended but at least the pacifying element had been introduced. By the early 1870s, a new commercial enterprise was being established in Micronesia, the copra trade. Pearl shell and all other products were nothing compared to copra, which has replaced the cumbersome and costly coconut oil. Copra has only been known in the Pacific since the 1860s. The introduction of copra changed the face of trade and gave a new value to the low atolls, which are the coconut's natural home. No work is so popular with the islanders as making copra, and there is no other to which they take to with the same zest. Frederick Moss, 1889. Copra was well on its way to becoming king. For decades afterwards, the dried meat of the coconut and the oil extracted from it to make soap, cosmetics, and other products would be the economic backbone of Micronesia. Adolf Capelli, an employee for a Hawaiian company, arrived in the Marshalls in 1859 to begin trade. 
Within a few years, he entered into partnership with José de Brum, a Portuguese who deserted a whale ship to live ashore on Ebon. The two men soon opened trade stations on several islands in the Marshalls. They built and operated their own ships to service these stations, and eventually acquired ownership of Likiep, which they planted in coconuts and used as a base for further expansion into eastern Micronesia. Trade stations sprang up on every island, sometimes two or three of them belonging to competing trading firms. The trade station was manned by a foreigner who settled on the island for a year or two to make his living before being whisked off by the company's ship. A few of the traders, however, chose to stay. Edward Milne, who partnered with Capelli and de Broom for a time. Isaac Madison, who came to the Marshalls at the same time as de Broom and worked with him for years. Thomas Fleming, who worked as a trader on Ujjayi and Lai before settling down on Majuro. With his storehouse of goods, cloth and iron tools, and tin food and biscuits, the island trader enticed people to make copra in exchange for his wares. Sometimes he offered rifles and liquor for sale as well. The company's ship would come periodically to take off the copra he had collected and to resupply his store. Andrew Farrell, an Australian trader, notes in his journal. In return for copra, Islanders first demanded tobacco, and it had to be the best. Scores of other articles were in demand. Light cloths, axes and knives, hand sewing machines, scissors, needles and thread, mirrors and combs, hooks and line, pots and pans, mouth organs, rice, hard biscuits, beads, perfume, and, in the Gilberts and Marshalls, rifles, flintlock muskets, revolvers, powder and shot. The rise of the resident trader meant that for the first time people need not depend on the next ship visit for trade opportunities. The store had come to stay in the islands. Life was changing for islanders. Battles were now fought with repeating rifles, not spears. Grass skirts and lava lavas were being discarded more and more in favor of print dresses and trousers. Many of the natives wear foreign clothing and hats of their own manufacture. They are a much more civilized race than the Gilbert Islanders. These people have one curious trait, they prefer those foreign articles which are dull in color and serviceable rather than those of gaudy hue. James Lyle Young, June 14, 1876. Marshallese could sell their copra to the local trader for two cents a pound. But the paramount chiefs, who had residual rights to the land, received a commission on all the copra made on their land. Before long, the chiefs could afford to buy suits and top hats for themselves and dress their wives in silk. Some were wealthy enough to purchase their own schooners. Meanwhile, Yap was becoming the center of the copra trade in western Micronesia. The German-owned Godefroy Company set up the first permanent trade station in 1869. Before that time, the island had been considered unsafe for foreigners, so none had ever taken up permanent residence there. Two years later, 
David Dean O'Keefe arrived in Yap. O'Keefe purchased a Chinese junk in Hong Kong and set up trading operations in Yap, soon expanding his network throughout the West to include Palau, the Southwest Islands, and some of the atolls to the east. Yapese may not have had much interest in clothes and the usual trade goods, but O'Keefe found something that Yap wanted very badly, the large limestone discs used as local money. He capitalized on this by hauling the huge stone discs quarried in Palau back to Yap in exchange for copra. From his house on an island in Yap's harbor, O'Keefe ruled over the extensive trading network he had built up. By the early 1880s, Yap had become the commercial center of the Western Carolines. The four trading companies there were exporting about 1,500 tons of copra yearly, far more than the output of any other island in Micronesia. Yap had a foreign population of about a dozen and was visited by 20 or 30 vessels a year. Yap was to the west what Jaluit had grown to become in the east. Other islands had their trade stations as well. Chuuk, which had been opened to trade at about the same time as Yap, had about a dozen traders scattered throughout the Lagoon Islands. They included August Hartman, Frederick Narun, and Pierre Nedelik, all of whom founded large families in Chuuk. Melander had a trading business on Koshrai, and Dominique Etchite began in the Marshalls and thereafter made his way to Ponape. Port towns grew up around some of the harbors as more and more merchant ships visited each year. The busiest of these was Jaluit, where 30 different vessels were making over a hundred calls a year. Two trading firms had made their headquarters on the island, their office buildings towering over the Nipa huts that lined the shore. The island had a hotel, two grog shops for thirsty seamen, and well-stocked stores that offered everything from ship biscuit to Strasbourg pâté de foie gras. Money and the things it buys were rapidly becoming an indispensable part of life throughout Micronesia. After centuries of survival on their own resources, the islanders had discovered the West. 